Now we come to lesson 67, which is titled An Economic Theory of Nationalism and Immigration. I am particularly fond of this topic because, dear students, I am a nationalist. You see, there are two different types of nationalism, the liberal or libertarian type and the socialist type. We will take a look at each of them and we will see that all of the negative effects attributed to nationalism actually stem from socialist nationalism, that is, from socialist, interventionist or protectionist nationalism, and never from liberal or rather libertarian nationalism. Well, nationalism and the existence of nations cause a certain unease among citizens in general, and even among lovers of liberty in particular. On the one hand, we justly associate nationalism with severe conflicts we all remember, such as those in the former Yugoslavia and the Middle East. On the other hand, it is also true that nationalism has played a positive role, for instance, in the dismemberment of the former Soviet Union. In fact, nationalism has often had positive, favorable consequences for the advancement of civilization. How can we grasp these two seemingly contradictory phenomena? Economic theory comes to our aid, and today we are going to examine an economic analysis of the concept of nation. The starting point for our analysis will be to explain how we should understand the term nation, according to economic theory. Well, a nation should be understood as a subset of civil society. Remember that we understand society as an extremely complex process, comprised of human interactions and driven by the force of entrepreneurship. When we talk about a nation being a subset of that process, we are conceiving of a nation as a spontaneous order, a living order of human interactions, which is comprised of a number of patterned behaviors that are learned, developed, and perfected in an evolutionary manner. And those patterned behaviors, which constitute the links in the social process we have called a nation, are basically of a linguistic, cultural or historical, religious and, much less importantly, racial nature. Of all those patterned behaviors adopted in some way by the members of the spontaneous order we have called a nation, perhaps the most important have to do with language. So, now I would like to bring up the entire Austrian theory on the emergence and evolution of institutions. The development of this theory began with Karl Menger, and it reached its highest degree of refinement starting with Hayek. Remember that institutions are simply frameworks of patterned behavior which human beings, generation after generation, tacitly learn to adopt because without realizing it, we better achieve our ends if we perform those pattern behaviors. In other words, society is an institutional, spontaneous order, a process in which the participants learn to carry out certain patterned behaviors of a linguistic, moral, cultural, historical, religious or other nature. As you can see, this analysis links our theory on the evolutionary emergence of institutions and society with the concept of a nation as a subset of the process of civil society. Thus, the first conclusion we reach is that nations are, so to speak, living spontaneous orders. That is to say, they are constantly emerging, growing, evolving and developing. And those nations, those subsets can also eventually stagnate or even disappear and be absorbed into others which may be richer, broader, freer or more advanced. And if nations are constantly evolving, we can all understand that the principle of establishing a fixed border with a nation presents a conflict, since the nation is always evolving. Its limits are not clearly defined, but diffuse. Also, different nations perpetually compete with each other. Some swallow up others and predominate. Some disappear. It is impossible to objectively establish a border. We cannot say that at a certain point one nation ends and another begins. To do so simply creates insoluble conflicts and violence. Furthermore, it contradicts the theoretical view we are expressing on the spontaneous market order and the nation. Well, our next step is to consider the essential principles of nationalism, that is, of the view of the social process based on nations, but liberal nationalism. I am referring to nations that compete in an environment of liberty without the use of violence or coercion. 
I am talking about relationships based on what we call contractual ties in an open society, as opposed to what we call hegemonic ties. Please take note. Three principles provide the foundation for a healthy, peaceful and harmonious relationship between nations, understood as spontaneous orders. The first is the principle of self-determination. The second is the principle of complete freedom of trade between nations. And the third is the principle of freedom of emigration and immigration. A fourth principle, such as the existence of an international monetary system like the pure gold standard, could be added. Let us explore in a little more detail each of these principles. What does the principle of self-determination refer to? According to this principle, each national group must at all times have the possibility of freely deciding which political state it wishes or does not wish to be part of. Or to put it more accurately from a scientific standpoint, each subset of civil society must have the liberty to decide which political group it wishes or does not wish to belong to. And here our concept of nation yields various possibilities. For instance, as a result of the freely expressed will of its members, one nation may be scattered across different political states. One example of this is the Anglo-Saxon nation, which is perhaps the most advanced, lively, fruitful and dynamic at this point in history. And it is spread over different states, such as the United Kingdom, Ireland, the United States and countries of the old Commonwealth, like Canada, Australia and New Zealand. We could also mention the German nation. The German-speaking nation has about 100 million inhabitants scattered across at least three political states in Europe. I am talking about Germany, of course, the Federal Republic of Germany, Austria and part of Switzerland. The opposite situation is also possible. Different nationalities or nations can choose to jointly form one political state. Such is the case of Switzerland, where part of the Italian nation part of the French nation, la Suisse Romande, and part of the German nation peacefully coexist. In fact, the Swiss learn German, Italian and French, regardless of whether they belong to the French nation, the Italian nation or the German nation. Differences aside, perhaps we could say the same about Spain, where within the same state, the nation of Castile Leon, the nation of Catalonia, Valencia, and the Balearic Islands, and the Basque nation live together. We could even mention a fourth nation, the Galician or Galician Portuguese nation. Fernando Pessoa explains this in detail in his well-known essay on liberal nationalism. Now, I would like to make a couple of clarifications about the principle of self-determination. I will begin by noting that self-determination does not necessarily have to be the result of an explicit political decision, though that cannot be ruled out. A referendum may be held and may give rise to a decision to split a state in two or to create a new state. There are many historical examples which show that this can be done peacefully and satisfactorily without any problem. One instance that comes to mind is the peaceful separation of Norway and Sweden. This took place at the beginning of the 20th century, in the first decade. Another more recent example is the referendum which led to the separation of the Czech and Slovak nations. Czechoslovakia was one state, and as the result of a referendum, it split into two. There was disagreement as to the speed at which liberalizing measures would be implemented after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Czech Republic was moving at a faster pace than Slovakia, so a referendum was held. And today, the Czech Republic is one state, and Slovakia is another. Prague is the capital of one, and Bratislava is the capital of the other. These are cases in which an explicit decision has been freely made to exercise the will to self-determination by separating. There have been other cases in which this has been attempted but has not been achieved, because in the end, a sufficient majority has not been obtained, according to the principle of majority rule, such as in the successive attempt made by the French-speaking Canadian province of Quebec to separate from the rest of Canada, or the more recent case of Scotland. Now, it is also possible for a nation or a group of nations to determine for themselves by custom which state they wish or do not wish to be part of. In other words, without any need for an explicit decision via referendum, but rather one made simply via the constant unfolding of history in which people manifest their desire to live together. 
Dear students, it is very important for minority groups to always have the possibility of seceding. And based not only on criteria of nationality, but on any criteria. For that is the only way to ensure that they are not exploited through a process in which majorities coerce minorities, and minority groups have no capacity to opt out of that oppression or exploitation. The second essential principle on which liberal nationalism must rest is the principle of free trade. Free trade means that borders must disappear, restrictionist trade measures must disappear, tariffs must disappear, and goods and services must flow freely. In fact, this was one of the guiding principles, the customs union, of the founding of the European Economic Community, which preceded the European Union. Freedom of trade is important, because if a nation decides not to adhere to this principle and instead to raise its borders and prevent the arrival of foreign goods, then it is deciding to be what is known as an autarky. When economic autarky exists, the state expects the entire economy to revolve solely around the natural resources the country possesses within its borders. Autarky is unviable, especially under the current circumstances. From a theoretical standpoint, it is always unviable. But in a globalized world like ours, it is particularly so. Because autarky basically reduces the citizens it affects to subsistence level or extreme poverty. Therefore, because a protectionist nation has to depend on just the resources of its own small geographical area, its development capacity is extraordinarily limited. Furthermore, it becomes a public danger to the rest of the nations, because it faces an obvious temptation to expand its borders militarily, in order to obtain more resources. Indeed, it was ultimately protectionist nationalism which encouraged the devastating wars of the last century. Nazi Germany, for instance, sought to expand its borders, because there was no oil in Germany. Thus, it was thought necessary to conquer Romania, and then to invade the Ukraine, and then to invade Russia, and so on, in a never-ending process. Every protectionist nation which does not pursue the principles of international free trade is bound to continually force the expansion of its borders in order to obtain more economic, material and human resources. This is also what happened with Japan, and it became a dangerous threat. Confined to its islands, it lacked sufficient resources. And what was the mentality back then? Instead of engaging in free trade, as is done today, Japan tried to conquer China to gain more citizens, more people to tax, more mines, more natural resources, more oil. This is the logic of violence, war, genocide and militarism, as opposed to the logic of peace and trade, in which people come out ahead, and it is not necessary to conquer anything, because I can access any resource simply by offering my own, in an environment of liberty. Therefore, bear in mind that each and every war stems from socialist nationalism, from protectionist nationalism, ultimately from socialism. The key to ending violence in the Middle East, in Iraq for instance, is free trade, capitalism and the market economy. Remember Montesquieu, whom we have so often quoted in this course, and who wrote, Everywhere there is commerce, there are gentle mores. In contrast, everywhere protectionist nationalism prevails, there are violent mores. Trade is replaced with robbery, with the law of might makes right. Moreover, there is an important economic law I would like you all to have a clear grasp of. Other things being equal, when a nation is part of a small political state, it is much more difficult for the state to impose centralist and conflict-generating protectionism. And the smaller the state, the more difficult it is. Think of a very small state like Monaco, or a small state like Greece, for instance. Such a state cannot raise its borders, because the state is small, and thus its territory is small. It has very few resources, and people would die of hunger. Hence, the smaller a state is, the more obliged it is, if it wishes to survive, to open its borders to liberty. In contrast, the larger a state is, think of the former Soviet Union with all of Siberia, the more it can afford, so to speak, to raise its borders, since it has practically every resource. But, as always, this is a ceteris paribus economic law. Ceteris paribus means other things being equal. The smaller a state is, the more compelled it is to engage in free trade, and the more it suffers from the tragedy of protectionism, if it insists on employing it.
The third principle of liberal nationalism is the principle of freedom of emigration and immigration, that is, the free circulation of people. But what do we mean by the free circulation of people or human beings? Does that mean I have the right to go wherever I want? Think about it. Imagine this is your house, and there is freedom of emigration and immigration, and I enter your house, or I go wherever I want. I kick the door in and settle in your living room. Is that okay or not? No. Be careful. The freedom of emigration and immigration is subject to law, to general legal principles. On the one hand, this means that the state must not raise its borders and prevent the arrival of outsiders when an agreement has been freely reached between the newcomers and those who are receiving them. On the other hand, it also means that the state must not create an artificial magnet, for instance by immediately providing all new arrivals with free social security coverage, health care, education and subsidies. In that case, it should not surprise you to see makeshift boats arriving with poor, pregnant, sub-Saharan women in them about to give birth. That is precisely why they come, because here they can give birth while receiving the most advanced medical care and free of charge. Borders which prevent free agreements between people must not be established. Likewise, artificial magnets which lead to unchecked growth in welfare state spending that cannot be financed must not be established. However, if I am an entrepreneur, and I need labor, and I have reached an agreement with someone from Latin America or from Africa who has agreed to come, and I have agreed to sponsor his stay here, that is, I provide a job and make sure he can live with a minimum of dignity, I must have the liberty to bring him here. No one should hinder me in any way. For instance, the local unions should not accuse me of unfair competition, since such workers are willing to accept lower wages. Listen, privileged worker, you are the exploiter. You want to keep those with the greatest need from coming to work in Spain. In any case, there must be a local sponsor. So, if, for whatever reason, I cease to need that worker's services, and no one else wishes to hire him, and no one is willing to back his stay in the country, he will have to leave the country. No one has a right to settle in or to occupy supposedly public areas, to build slums in public parks, like in Brazil, or to occupy a private property or a street, which we suddenly find full of tents and destitute people. No, ladies and gentlemen. That should be private property, or managed as if it were. If people in such a situation have no work, they must leave the country. Hence, the freedom of circulation is subject to general legal principles, as if this were a club. Papa State must not prevent you from freely negotiating to hire a foreigner. The welfare state must not artificially attract people like a magnet and slum-type phenomena and occupation of public areas against the will of local owners must not take place. These are the essential principles of liberal nationalism, and you should have a very clear understanding of them. Then, liberal or libertarian nationalism becomes an extremely powerful force, which drives the development of civilization and increases the prosperity of peoples, the wealth, development and per capita income of citizens. We are going to look upward at the European Union and downward at the regions that make up our own country, Spain. For if goods circulate freely and there is free trade and self-determination and so on, and a state in the European Union goes crazy and decides to increase taxes dramatically, impose more regulations, make life more difficult for entrepreneurs and drive up costs, resources will immediately leave that country and productive factors will go to other countries that are more receptive to entrepreneurship, impose a lighter tax burden, etc. Therefore, when any protectionist measure which is particularly harmful to the economy is taken in isolation, in a free trade environment, it is self-frustrating. It cannot be implemented. When a 35-hour work week was adopted in France, it was a blessing for Spain, because French companies simply relocated. They just cross the border into Spain, where there is a 40-hour work week. Also, I was once giving a lecture in Salamanca, and I noticed that there were many Spanish entrepreneurs there, and they all had Portuguese tax identification numbers, because in Portugal there is no wealth tax, for instance. Thus, in a context of liberty, there is no possibility of imposing protectionist measures which impoverish everyone. The same is true within Spain. 
If there is no estate tax in Navarre, and there is no estate tax in the Basque country, but this tax is levied in the rest of the autonomous regions, then investments relocate. And since the different autonomous regions do not wish to lose their source of wealth, they are obliged, one after the other, to eliminate the estate tax. That is how the estate tax was abolished, or substantially reduced, in Madrid, and in practically all of the other autonomous regions, except Catalonia and a few others. Imagine that. Catalonia, which is so in favor of independence, is despairing because the rest of the autonomous regions have eliminated the estate tax, and capitalists and entrepreneurs are investing outside of Catalonia. And instead of abolishing the estate tax, the region responds by pushing in Madrid for the estate tax to be re-established in all of Spain. In other words, it pushes to give more strength to the centralized power in Madrid. Ultimately, behind every centralist measure, we find protectionist nationalists. Since they cannot limit themselves to imposing the protectionist measure in their own constituencies without incurring a heavy cost, they insist on a forced, one-size-fits-all solution. And thus, they strengthen the authority in Madrid by requesting that it impose the tax in all of the autonomous regions. This is the very logic employed by European interventionists, who, realizing that if Germany or France imposes a protectionist or social state measure, it loses competitiveness, seeks a one-size-fits-all solution via Brussels. They want Brussels to force everyone to adopt the regulation in question. In other words, they give more power to Brussels. Protectionist nationalists always, always without fail, end up giving more power to the central political body, which they claim to hate so much. And there are very clear cases, for example that of Spain. In the autonomous region of Madrid, the wealth tax was, for all practical purposes, eliminated, and in other autonomous regions as well. And in the end, the state decided to eliminate the wealth tax in all of Spain. So, as you can see, in an environment of liberty, the different regions race and compete to dismantle regulations, taxes and so on, and to attract resources. And as a result, we all benefit. Moreover, any isolated plan to increase taxes or to increase protectionism is blocked. What would the role of the state be in liberal nationalism? The truth is that the role of the state would be reduced to a minimum, to practically a jurisdictional role. In that context of freely circulating people, capital and goods, based on the self-determination of peoples or nations, the principle of secession, freedom of emigration and immigration and free trade, if a state, the crown of Spain, should embody anything, it should simply embody these three principles. It would make sure that the rules of the game, based on the principles of self-determination, free trade and freedom of emigration and immigration, were the same for everyone and it would judge whether or not certain groups have been discriminated against on the grounds of their nationalities, political allegiances, particular states of origin and so forth. And the higher we go in the political scale, the more jurisdictional the involvement of the corresponding political body should be. It should simply watch to make sure the rules of the game are the same for all. The political bodies in closest contact with citizens, specifically in cities at the municipal level, are the best suited to establish a regulation concerning the relationships between different human beings, or even the allocation of remaining public resources. And we conclude the article by contrasting liberal nationalism with socialist nationalism. Listen, nationalism is not bad per se. Nationalism is bad only when it is national socialism. That is, when it is socialist, when it seeks to forcibly impose a particular culture or language, like when everyone is obliged to study in Catalan or in Spanish. Why should we criticize the Catalans for imposing a language when we are doing the same here? It is bad when citizens are not allowed to choose the language they wish to speak, and to choose, either directly or via the corresponding voucher, the school they wish to send their children to, and the teaching methods to be used. Nationalism is bad when it seeks to forcibly impose cultural protectionism, like when people are permitted to watch movies only in Spanish or only in Catalan. Listen, I will watch movies in whatever language I want, in English, in the original version, in Catalan, in Swedish, or in any other language. It is bad when the attempt is made to force you to buy only Castilian products and no Catalan products. 
That is when violence and conflict break out. But if nationalism is liberal, if one defends her nation without an inferiority complex, and with the knowledge that her nation is competing with other nations, then she strengthens it. There is a deepening of specialization, of the division of knowledge, and of distinctive cultural characteristics, and we all benefit from the exchange. Whereas interventionist or statist nationalism generates conflict and violence, liberal nationalism fuels the development of civilization and the prosperity of peoples. Can one of these thick-headed nationalists possibly be converted to liberal nationalism? Actually, if the love of his nation prevails over his narrow-minded obscurantism, he can conceivably be converted. Any sensible person will understand that if people wish to defend their nation using state violence and protectionism, what they are really doing is closing off their nation, their little environment, and setting it apart from everyone else's. As I have already explained, they are creating a dialectic of violence and conflict, that is, of all-against-all warfare, in which the first to be harmed is going to be the very nation the people are claiming to defend, which can even disappear from the map. In contrast, in a context of liberty and competition, every nation finds its niche of specialization, so that it can benefit by making exchanges with other nations. This enriches everyone. In fact, the great wealth of Spain lies in its diversity, in the fact that the Canary Islands, Galicia, Catalonia, and the Balearic Islands are strikingly different from each other. Still, we are all enriched when we make exchanges with each other and cooperate in an environment of liberty. The same can be said for the entire European Union. What was a force of disintegration, violence and conflict in a context of socialist nationalism becomes, in a context of liberal nationalism, a force which drives civilization and fuels limitless economic development. So, I want you to know that I am a nationalist. I am in favor of breaking the state down into small units, and one potential way of doing that is through nationalism. It is possible to conceive of a Europe made up of two or three hundred small states, and two or three hundred free cities. Do not be shocked. Germany was like that before it was unified. Before unification, Germany consisted of around 200 free states and free cities. The inhabitants all spoke the same language, German. People and goods circulated freely. The famous Goethe was the defense minister of one of those little states. In Goethe's time, Weimar had 600 soldiers, if I recall correctly. 600! Imagine that! No damage can be done with 600 soldiers. Then, with a militaristic, interventionist Prussian approach, Germany was unified and instead of 600, it had 6 million soldiers, and two world wars followed with tens of millions of deaths as a result of unification and interventionist nationalism. The National Socialist German Workers' Party. That was the Nazi Party, Hitler's party. However, in the context of 200 small states, free city-states like Monaco and Andorra, which trade with each other, it would not be possible to catch millions and millions of citizens in a political trap through intervention. For if I am not satisfied with life in Andorra, I can simply emigrate and go to San Marino, or to Monaco, or to an independent Iran Valley. Do you see what I'm saying? When people vote with their feet, liberty and human dignity always wins out and no one is enslaved by the arbitrariness of whatever political majorities may prevail at any particular time. So, three cheers for liberal nationalism, autonomous decentralization, and the dismemberment of large states into small political units. If there is a message in this course, it is that the state is very dangerous, and therefore we must do everything possible to diminish its power. One way to do this is to break the state down into tiny pieces. A step forward might be to increase the self-government of Spain's autonomous regions and decrease the power of the central government. Moreover, the autonomous regions are still too large. And that is something I once explained to Jordi Pujol. Catalonia is still too large. Why should all the decisions which affect Catalonia be made in Barcelona? Groups must be permitted to secede or form enclaves. Perhaps some would like to join Castile and the people of the Iran Valley would like to be independent. Maybe the capital city of Girona would be declared a free city-state, and so on.